بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, welcome again in this new meeting of uh, Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation uh, CME chapter online CME meetings uh, and uh, today is a transplantation day one of transplantation days and we are honored by the great moderator and great speakers uh, we have today let me start first by introduction of our great moderator, moderator which is uh, Professor Ayman Rifai, Professor of Nephrology and uh, Medicine in Kidney Transplantation and uh, He is the Vice President of Kidney uh, Mansura Kidney Transplantation and Urology and Nephrology Center and the current President of the European Society of Nephrology and Transplantation and this uh, transplantation chapter in the Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Science Transplantation. Uh, he will introduce more, uh, our great speaker, uh, Professor Faisal Shaheen. Uh, I am really pleased to have him with us today. Uh, he is a senior consultant, nephrologist and transplantation in the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, and the past president of MISAT and uh, uh, Saudi Organ Transplantation Society and the current president of uh, uh, member of WHO uh, task force group for organ transplantation and donation. Uh, we, uh, we will speak about uh, one of the important topics in transplantation, of course, which is transplantation, uh, transplantation malignancies or post transplantation malignancies, which is, I think, it is uh, unique for all organ transplantation procedures. Uh, many and many professors uh, are uh, present with us today, and uh, I, uh, I am to welcome them, Professor Dawlat Bilal, Professor Ahmed Alawa, Professor Hashem Sayyid, Professor Said Khamis, and we are waiting more and more to join, and we can expect a very hot discussion after this interesting talk. Please, Professor Ayman, take the floor to lead the, the, this session, and unmute yourself, and I think you, was unmute. you are unmuted, Dr. Ayman. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Tonight we are pleased and honored to have one of the figures in transplantation, uh, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in Arab world and uh, internationally as well, uh, Dr. Faisal Shaheen. Uh, Dr. Shaheen is a senior consultant physician and nephrologist. He is the head of nephrology at uh, Dr. Suleiman Faqih Hospital. He is also the advisor of the uh, International Society for Organ Donation and Procurement. And he is the co-chairman of the WHO Task Force for Organ and Tissue Donation and Transplantation. Uh, Dr. Shaheen held many positions, actually. He was the general uh, adv director of the SCOT, the Saudi Center for Organ Transplantation, since uh, 1993. Uh, he is the past president of the MISOT, Middle East Society of Organ Transplantation, for two years, between 1996 and 1998. Uh, and actually, for those who don't know that uh, Dr. Faisal was graduated from Mansoura Faculty of Medicine, 1981. Uh, he joined the Faculty of Medicine in Mansoura in 1975. And I remembered him actually very well because I joined Mansoura Faculty of Medicine in 1991 while he was in his last year in the, in the college. Uh, of course, Dr. Faisal is always welcomed and we are honored to have him as a guest faculty in all our ESNT events. Tonight, Dr. Faisal is going to address a very important topic, which is one of the most uh, fe feared and devastating complication of organ transplantation, which is the post transplant malignancy. Please, Dr. Faisal. Thank you very much. Uh... Actually, I am thrilled and honored today to be among our colleague, friend uh, from Egypt. I, I am keen to, to be with them all the time 
because I felt that I am home always. And I'm always at home, either I'm in Egypt or uh, speaking with them or see them uh, through the webinar. Uh, thanks, Dr. Yasser, to give me that uh, this opportunity to represent one of the important issue, as it is mentioned by my friend and colleague, Ayman. Uh, and it, it is very important subject, very sensitive subject as well. And it have many discipline and that, that's why we have to think carefully how to deal with post-transplant oncology or malignancy. My talk, okay, sorry, it's not moving. Okay. My talk is, is okay. My talk reference today is very important for everyone. Because this is, uh, we are not dealing with a subject which have fixed rules. We, it is a, 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 a subject which is important. It depends sometimes about the experience of the people. It depends about the, the hostel uh, uh, guideline. It depends about national guideline and international guideline. So it is something which is very delicate. You have to deal with the patient, you have to deal with the donor, you have to deal with the recipient, you have to deal with the medication, many, many other things. So that's why it, it is very important. And I'm sure that every one of us is dealing with different in different way with his own patient. But there is fixed things which can cause mainly a problem. I am... In my in my talk, the reference for me, I am going to look for the uh, post transplant malignancy after pediatric kidney transplantation. It is very important to look for some categories of patients which live for a long time in order to see if there is any complication happening to those people or not. This article by Serrano Oscar, which is very important. The second article is about risk factor associated with post kidney transplant malignancy. This is from Cancer Center International Work, and this is for Mr. Ben uh, Springer. This he is from Australia, and he is the pioneer, which is looking mainly for the malignancy post transplantation. I remember that I attend to him many talks, which shows to me exactly that. This uh, cancer is, is, is overlooked. Many people don't look it, for it carefully. And he was collecting data from uh, everywhere in the world, even from Saudi Arabia and from Egypt and other, looking mainly for the transplant malignancy. Again, the follower of uh, Dr. Ben Sprenger is Jeremy Chapman. I think all of us know him. Uh, very well. He was TTS president and he was uh, responsible about uh, journal of the TTS. And he he looked carefully again about the risk of cancer and this uh, according to kidney allograft function and the graft loss and return back to dialysis. This is a good article that come out of Jeremy and looked mainly for the long term follow up of uh, categories of patients which develop. Uh, some cancer post transplantation. Again, uh, there is uh, uh, our colleague uh, Obels from Germany. He was looking about graft loss and non Hodgkin lymphoma uh, with the induction therapy of uh, the patient. So he differentiates between different kind of of immunosuppression drug and the incidence of non Hodgkin lymphoma. So this is the main holders which I am. I will depend. My talk it will be around it. So renal transplantation for sure, it is good for our patient in, in end stage renal disease, and they give them more life, more good life, uh, better than dialysis, but yet uh, still the immunosuppression, you know, take a long way to go to be established with this patient. We, we, we have a learning phase in, in the starting of uh, a potent immunosuppression drug like the chronomas like uh, cyclosporin, and we don't know exactly which level we should go. And that's why we hamper sometimes our patients with uh, a lot of immunosuppression and the consequence of uh, 
a very high dose of immunosuppression is to get, unfortunately, some side effect which are unpleasant. And again, it wars the graft function at the later stage. So there is no doubt that immunosuppression prevent the graft rejection and make transplant uh, last longer. But at the same time, immunosuppression, it, it, uh, it cause malignancy, which is very important in morbidity and mortality of, the, of those patients. And the cancer became a second leading cause of this among our uh, recipients in most of the Western country. Uh, the incidence of the cancer and kidney transplant is generally increased by two to three fold compared to the general population, which again is a very high incidence uh, post kidney transplantation. Skin cancer is the most common malignancy seen in nearly 50% of post transplant recipients, including those with renal transplantation. And I remember that one article of Mr. Bin shows that after 35 years or 40 years, the patient in Australia, they develop skin cancer. 95% of them, they have some sort of skin cancer, which is a very high incidence in, in such patients. For sure, we are different a little bit from those uh, Western country in, regarding skin cancer, but uh, we should mentioned this important and we have to look for our patient either they develop some sort of skin cancer or not sorry i have to go back a little bit so again one of the important uh, cancer which we have is btld both transplant lymphoproliferative disorder this is the second most common malignancy in a solid organ transplant recipient uh, and uh, uh, the, the, those are, the, again, one of the causes of the death in kidney transplant, and its cancer-related mortality has become high and high which you, when we started to give more immune suppressions to our patient, especially if they have rejection or they were actually coming from disease donation, that we should give a very high dose of uh, immunosuppression. So immunosuppression is uh, considered to be one of the important risk factors which can uh, affect our patients. Again, this slide is important, which shows that we don't gain a lot, uh, but I, I have to look for it in another way, that there is, since uh, many years, 1988 till 1995, we gain only six months again in half-life of our patients. So it was 7.5, 7.9, and goes up to 8 in 1995. I'm sure now we gain a little bit more, but we have to consider here that we are taking more risky patients and, 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 and doing transplant for them, and this, this again will affect the outcome of the of the transplantation and this is uh, very important and that we don't gain a lot uh, but we, especially when we have a good immunosuppression drug so as i mentioned before that we have to look for a very long term of those patients this is one study which is coming from minnesota and it is mainly represented by Tim Brewey in, in, in uh, one stage. Tim is, is, is one of our colleagues coming many times to our area here and they present about uh, cancer and both transplantation. And this study is uh, again looking mainly for uh, both transplant malignancy in pediatric uh, patients. Why pediatric and why it is important? Because the pediatric patient, the recipient, is taking the organ and stay for a long time. They don't develop mainly uh, cardiac disease or uh, some hypertension, diabetes, and other things which can cause morbidity and mortality in such patients. So, but they stay for long, and we can look and see how incidence of those cancer and on those patients. So they were looking about the case from 1963 to 2015 in Minnesota. And here you can see the result, which is again amazing result, uh, show that the median patient survival was 33 years. So 33 years is a long 
way we know, but if you take it for a patient who is 40 or 50, it is very, you know, it, it, uh, he will be around 80 or 90. So we're looking for another category of patient with uh, younger age in order to see any complication. And during the period, 260 individual passed away from, uh, from the number of the patient they collect. And 47 of them had post-transplant malignancy. So again, there is a significant number of patients who have malignancy and died uh, after a long time of transplantation. Uh, and they found that uh, this is 136 people at 29 years old and at 20 years old, post kidney transplantation proportion of having malignancy is 13% which is again a significant number for those uh, uh, children which become young and become old after many years of transplantation to develop uh, malignancy. And uh, the study found that post-transplant malignancy, which has a negative impact in survival, is more common in children in pediatric populations. We know that uh, pediatric uh, transplantation, or at least the survival, of the patients who, when they are young, they are, they are better than uh, elderly patients and the outcome is good. And uh, we, I am sure that many of the pediatricians, which is among us now, know that the outcome of transplantation in pediatric patients uh, was no complication for a long time. But still we have to think about those patients can develop cancer after a long time, especially after 30 years post-transplantation. What is the incidence ratio? What's what happened in malignancy post transplantation? Now I will see some of the of the common uh, malignancy and see how much it's they increase uh, uh, from general population. Non melanoma skin cancer and post transplant uh, lymphoproliferative disease, renal cell carcinoma, lip cancer, caboose sarcoma. They are more than five fold, which is very high more than the general population. Thyroid cancer, melanoma, multiple myeloma, leukemia, from two to five fold, and brain cancer, prostatic cancer, lung uh, cancer is less, which is less than two. So again, the, 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 the incidence, if we compare it the transplantation to general population, we found that uh, there are a high incidence uh, of uh, uh, cancers uh, could happen to our patient. Now, This is the cause of death in, with function graft after renal transplantation. And we can see here malignancy is the third one. But nowadays, cardiovascular become less, malignancy become more, and also infection is still the second one. But malignancy was the third, it's still the third, but the number of cardiovascular coming down and malignancy is going up. So the malignancy post-transplantation is important and it can cause uh, deaths with function graft after a long time, which is very important to know. From where did this come and how did we, uh, we, 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 from where we get the cancer post-transplantation, how, how the people develop cancer? Here you can see that mostly the patients develop cancer post-transplantation, either it is de novo occurrence in the recipient, just by itself is coming to, to the recipient, or the recipient can have some recurrence malignancy. He, the, he had malignancy before, and probably he doesn't have the proper time for waiting, and and he don't be, he's not treated before transplant, and so he will have some recurrence of malignancy in, in his body in his own, either the kidney or the lung or some other places, or transmissions of malignancy from the donor. And this is happening mainly from the deceased donor, cadaver donor, and uh, as uh, all of us know that uh, Egypt now is planning to have uh, a deceased donor, and that's why we have to screen the patient, the donor carefully from any malignancy in order to avoid the transmissions of malignancy from the donor to recipient. What is the risk factors for those patients? It is either patient-related risk factor, 
transplant related or medication related. For the patients related, recipient age. If we have elderly patients, we get more incidence of the cancer. Someone who had previous cancers, the incidence will be high. And sun exposures prove to be one of the important, very important factors causing uh, cancer uh, skin. And the viral infection I will speak about, which is important to causing some uh, important uh, uh, malignancy, both transplant and the duration of dialysis, which is again very interesting that if uh, of the patient being dialyzed for a long time, he is prone to have cancer post transplantation more than the one who been dialyzed less. The, the mechanism is not clearly, but it is known uh, that uh, dialysis play a factor in, in, in malignancy. Uh, transplant related. Donor transmissions, as I mentioned, it can come from, especially in the deceased donor, it is less in living donor, but it can come donor's type and rejection. If we have someone who develop rejection, we give him a lot of immunosuppression to sacrifice the, 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 the organ, and this again can cause malignancy post-transplantation. Medical related is uh, immunosuppression. How much the patient is taking immunosuppression and what's the protocol used to immunocompromise the patient or to immunosuppress the patient in order to accept the organ? It is very important factor, uh, which can again affecting the survival of the patient and affect also the outcome of the patient and the incident of uh, malignancy. Uh, what's the induction therapy? And what is the maintenance therapy of those patients? This all can affect the, the outcome and the, and the incidence of malignancy post-transplant. So there are possible modifiable. We have to look how we can overcome this problem. In short, we have to look for acute rejection. If we got someone who had acute rejection, at least we have to avoid that because acute rejection will let us to give more immunosuppression and give more probably uh, some kind of uh, immunosupp potent immunosuppression in order to overcome the rejection. So we are looking, we think that low dose of TAC and MMF and steroid, all of this can prevent at least us to reach to the acute rejections or chronic allograft loss. Uh, by this, at least we can avoid a heavy immunosuppression. Chronic allograft nephropathy, which again, it happened to many patients, either it's come from the patient in Delf or from the graft or outcome of the graft. So we have to prevent delayed onset of the function of the graft in order to optimize our immunosuppression immediately post-operative. We have to, again, to teach the patient how to take the medication because some of the, those patients neglect taking their, those patients and then get rejection and then we have to give them uh, again, immunosuppression drug in order to sacrifice or, or to, to, to get rid of the rejection. Uh, so again, we have to think about those patients which uh, poor compliance or uh, children to give them probably prolonged release of uh, tacrolimus, uh, not uh, so it, to take it one time a day, not uh, every 12 hours in order to avoid neglections of those patients especially non-adherent patients to immunosuppression. Cardiovascular disease, we have to, again, to try to withdraw early the steroid or no steroid in order to avoid to have new onset diabetes after transplantation. And in malignancy as a whole, we have to reduce the immunosuppression, but trying to avoid rejection also. And by the timing, we have to look carefully and monitoring the drug in order to, uh, to, to give them uh, cancer post-transplantation. Interleukin-2, TAG, MMF, are not associated with any additional risk of cancer. Uh, to prevent CMV and monitor for BK viremia is important. 
Uh, tag MMF, as I mentioned, again, don't seem to increase the risk of BK virus uh, nephritis. Here we can see, as I mentioned, smoking. And uh, for our colleague who smoke, please try uh, to avoid it. So the smoking increased the risk of lung cancer. And here we can see this is a significant uh, difference between the people who smoke and do not smoke. Not smoke is the least incidence to have lung cancer and smoking have very high incidence, uh, which again, uh, we have to speak with our patient about the important to, to quit smoking, uh, especially post-transplantation. Again, you can see this is the malignancy, risk of any malignancy, not only the lung, any malignancy increase with a uh, smoker. So the smokers is prone to have more malignancy, uh, not only uh, the lung, others also as well. Again, lymphoma, non hydrogen lymphoma is increased in deceased donors. Why? Because we are giving more immunosuppression, potent immunosuppression, suppress the immunity more, and this is will have prone. This is a, a, a huge number of patients which show that non hydrogen lymphoma increased uh, in deceased donors because of the protocols which are giving either a quadruple therapy or triple therapy and heavy or heavy immune heavy induction therapy in order to avoid rejection. And again, one slide important to see different kind of uh, induction therapy which we use either interleukin, anti-cymoglobulin, and cymoglobulin lymphocyte, immunoglobulin, and OKT3, and the incidence uh, of incidence ratio of uh, lymphoma, which shows that once we start to give uh, a very heavy immunosuppression to increase the risk to develop cancer is more and more increased. This slide is important as because it, it shows all the immunosuppression drug uh, and it shows the most, mostly the, the immunosuppression which can cause uh, tumor or uh, malignancy. Uh, it shows that cyclosporin was on of those and the top of those and also the cocktail between cyclosporin and MMF, and uh, after that cyclosporin, azacyprine, then tag MMF. It seems that tag and MMF is less and and it's better than to have cyclosporin either with aza or MMF. So incidence is less. Uh, again, in, in one study, it is controversial. Actually, we. We can see that the MMF brought, not causing more malignancy. And this is very interesting. And uh, that's why it was uh, compared between the people who take lymphoma, uh, who had lymphoma uh, uh, and uh, any malignancy. It shows that MMF doesn't affect too much the outcome or the incidence of, uh, of um, cancers, the post transplantation using uh, mycophenolate. mycophenolate and uh, it, it is a controversial study. Some studies say no, uh, some other said not. Again, uh, if we look for the drug itself, which again important, our target today is the drug. The drug is causing a problem, and the drug we need, we need it. We need uh, we we need it for to to um, for as uh, induction therapy as a continuous therapy. Uh, uh, it's very important, but we have to know why this happened. Carcinogen inhibitors, uh, actually the rule as a carcinogenic is it had a lot of production of TGFB, production of fake F, production of interleukin, uh, sex promotion of behavior of non-transformed cell, reduced ability to repair radiation-induced DNA damage, enhanced blocked effect of taxol, uh, which is important again as a carcinogenic and increase the rate of uh, high bubulinative disorder uh, in HCV infected mice. So again, it shows either in the studies or in in, 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 in lab that uh, carcinogen inhibitor is a very important factor to cause uh, malignancy. As a cyobrine, this is again work in inhibition repair of splitting and lutating coding uh, mysteries, which again, very important factor to cause uh, uh, malignancy. 
Again, as I mentioned, I am, my reference is, is uh, different today. I am speaking about Mr. Ben, which I admire his work always. Uh, Mr. Ben he, he is from Australia and he was collecting data from everywhere in the world and bringing uh, data about the malignancy post-transplantation. Uh, and in his paper, I will discuss it a little bit, epidemiology, he, he analyzed the registry taking from different places, transplant recipient in SRTR, Australia, New Zealand, and some Europe country as well, uh, Europe and North America registry, all of this, this is epidemiology. And he found the increase in cancer incidence in kidney transplant is not uniform. It's different from one place to another. And sometimes it's not increased sometimes do not increase following kidney transplantation like a breast. This is a cancer breast, prostate cancer, ovarian, cervical, and the brain cancer. All of this is not difference, is not increasing post-transplantation. But in other side, there is lymphomas, melanoma, non-melanoma skin cancer, lung and colon cancer, liver cancer increased by two to four fold. So it is not homogeneous. Not every cancer will increase more, but there is some cancer not increased at all, and others are in, are, are increased more. Uh, one of the important things that genital urinary tract uh, cancers are most frequent malignancy in kidney transplant recipient after non melanotic skin cancer. Both BTLD, which is both transplant lymphoproliferative disease, increased. Incidents after kidney transplantation. There is no doubt one of the important cancers which we are dealing with is BTLD post transplant. Uh, it is uh, the high risk in EBV virus, uh, zero negative recipient. If he take from zero positive, uh, incidence of BTLD is high. Uh, uh, lymphoma slide predictions to occur in the transplant kidney. CNS lymphoma, most common after renal transplantation. So there are some disease, which cancer, which is almost increased both transplantation and very dangerous, especially BTLD. Again, if someone have a, usually the patient on dialysis, we are looking carefully after, even during dialysis about cystic change in the native kidney. Cystic change in the native kidney itself, it can uh, transform to be a malignancy at any time. And again, if we transplant patient with which he been in a long time on, on dialysis patient, uh, he can have some cancer in his native kidney. So it is common in patient with advanced renal failure. It is associated with the development of the kidney cancer in the native kidney. And again, as I mentioned before about dialysis, we have patients who have been in dialysis for a long time. This is more high risk to develop thyroid cancer, melanoma, urinary tract cancer, ovarian and prostatic cancer, less frequent in those uh, transplant recipients. So again, it is varies. Some cancers is, is more than the others, and some even we didn't, didn't show themselves after transplantation. Uh, as I mentioned before about the risk factors, I will just take it one by one. It is patient-related risk factor. And age is very important. Previous cancer and transmitted and the reactivation. Sun exposures, important, especially for the skin cancer. Viral infection, I will discuss it after. And duration on dialysis, it's important as well. There's something related risk factor, transplant the, the kidney related the donor, uh, donor transmission, donor type, rejection, all of this can affect uh, the outcome and can have more risk for the patient. Medication related, which is again important, the net immunosuppression. We have to think immunosuppression not only post transplant, even before that. Many of our patients already they have they been in immunosuppression drug before reaching to the end stage, especially those patients with nephrotic syndrome. They usually they have even if they can have uh, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, other cyprin, 
uh, steroid therapy, all of this even before transplantation. So the accumulative number, accumulative uh, numbers of of immunosuppression is important, and we have to consider it uh, from the start. So if we have some patient, we would better not to hamper him with immunosuppression, uh, especially if we know that there is no outcome uh, of those immunosuppression, and they all it is minimal. Uh, induction therapy is important again, very important. So we don't give uh, a lot of. Uh, 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 of immunosuppression uh, drug and as induction therapy and the maintenance therapy is important and the outcome of maintenance therapy is important this is a very very important uh, which we have to choose which kind of immunosuppression we are giving to our patient not to over uh, over uh, suppress his immunity uh, because this can bring to the cancer after that the, again it is found that there are some risk factors for patient death from the cancer, especially in male gen uh, gender. Is, uh, uh, they are prone to have more deaths. History of real cancer, if someone had uh, cancer before, and as I mentioned, how much immunosuppression he was taking, and uh, if he had lymphocyte depleting antibodies. What about donor transmission? In living donations, we have, we are, uh, and I, I'm very happy to, to see that this figure is very low uh, to have donor transmissions uh, from living related. Uh, it is 0.03%, uh, which is very low, but from deceased donor, it is, it is more. The, the most common transmitted cancers types are renal cancer, melanoma, lymphoma. And the high risk of transmissions is melanoma again, lung carcinoma, uh, curio carcinoma. Low risk of transmission again, uh, renal cell carcinoma, especially when it is small without capsular invasions, central nervous system uh, tumor, except medulloblastoma. This is again not trans transmitted. Overall risk cancer in kidney transplant uh, in living donor. 1,080 per 100,000 patients per year. So it is significant number actually, but uh, uh, in living it is less than a standard donor, which is 1,444 per 100,000 patients per year. And if we have some uh, deceased program, expanded criteria deceased donor is a little bit higher, 2,018 per 100,000. This is mainly due to the heavy induction therapy after, after transplantation. So recipient from living donor have a lower risk of cancer, particularly for genital urinary cancer and the BTLD. This is again very important to, to encourage uh, our patient to have living donor. Uh, again, we look for the previous cancer, which considered to be a high risk of all cause mortality and the, the, the hazard ratio is 1.5. Cancer-specific mortality hazard ratio is 3.1. Developing de novo malignancy, the hazard ratio is 1.9. So it is, again, very important if we have uh, someone who had cancer, we have to look carefully to treat him before considering him as uh, a recipient. Uh, treat them and to have a good enough waiting time in order to be sure that he is cured from the previous cancer. So the incidence of a specific malignancy, uh, it is varies according to the transplanted organ as well. And some time of transplantation like lung and liver, both transplant malignancy tend to be occur in the transplanted organ. So if we have it, it will come again to lung and liver. And kidney, it goes to the, the recipient, it affects the native kidney if, we, if it is transmitted. So it goes to the native kidney. Other cancer type vary depending on the transplant or organ. non hodgkin lymphoma and lung transplant recipient is double compared to the kidney, heart, and liver, and liver transplantation. Again, sun exposure is, is a very well-established factor causing skin cancer. Uh, Reduction of the incidence of non-melanomatous skin cancer by sunblock important 
and nicotinamide, uh, both of them can reduce the uh, skin cancer and significantly so it's reduced by 50%. There are some viruses, which is again, important to know that they are having associated cancer with them. Mainly it is five, five of them. EBV, which is important as a cause of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, smooth muscle tumor, HBV, squamous cell carcinoma, HCV, 8, caboot sarcoma, multiple myeloma, HIV, uh, plasmoblastic lymphoma, market cell carcinoma, HCV, hepatocellular carcinoma, plasma cell neoplasm, BK, glioma virus, urethral carcinoma. So again, there are viruses which is very important to, to be uh, seen before transplantation and to see it in the recipient. It is very important because the consequence uh, of having a tumor is more dangerous. So as I mentioned again, at least a very important virus which we should screen, and we think that it is carcinogenic and transplant recipient. ABV, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, ABV status, one of the important factors to cause BTLD, 50% of BTLD cases are EBV related. Uh, Epstein Barr virus mismatch between the donor and the recipient is important to know before transplant. Primary Epstein Barr virus infection post transplant is a major risk factor for EBV positive BTLD in early onset uh, transplantation, post kidney transplant, post transplantation lymphadenopathy. Very important, very important one. Again, one of the important cancers, which uh, usually we suffer a lot in Saudi Arabia from the number which we got long and early phase when we use, uh, when we start to use uh, uh, cyclosporin, it was caboose sarcoma. And we have so many publica publications showed that high dose of immunosuppression, especially cyclosporin, was associated with uh, caboose sarcoma. And once that is, we reduce the, the the treatment, the caboose sarcoma completely disappeared. Human babyloma virus, cervix, vulva, vagina, anus, and some oropharynx cancers is associated also with the viral infection, Merkel cell, polymerase, Merkel cell carcinoma. There is some other virus which is again could happen, especially hepatitis B and C, which is common in our area, can have liver, hepatocellular carcinoma, post-transplantation, PK polymorph can have some urological cancer. CMV is not clear, which we have it also here, associated with increased risk of post-transplant cancer. Uh, childhood, stronger relation between virus infection and virus-related cancer. So it is very, again, important, and it can happen to uh, even to the children which they receive transplantations. So it, Again, back cytomegalovirus uh, infection, as I mentioned, it, uh, it's uh, important, uh, but uh, still it doesn't uh, show that it causes a lot of uh, uh, malignancy post-transplantation. BK virus, which is important as uh, one factor of the graft failure, and it's increased the risk of graft loss as well. Uh, Sometimes we have it asymptomatic, Viremia, which occur in 30 to 45 percent of the kidney transplant recipient, uh, it is a BK virus uh, nephropathy occur in one to five percent of transplant recipient, result in graft loss in 40 to 60 percent, which is a significant number of graft loss could happen because of the K BK virus. Prevention of BK virus nephropathy uh, is the optimal therapeutic approach. Uh, both kidney, both the transplantation. Again, this is the duke cells and urine, which is the diagnostic of BK virus. I will not go through this too much. Again, the histology, it is known for our uh, pathologist, uh, uh, and it is easy to be recognized. Uh, focal interstitial mononuclear inflammatory cell, uh, presence of plasma cells, uh, necrotic tubular epithelium, presence of homogeneous internuclear inclusions body, 
this is again uh, how it looks like with uh, with the special stain, and it is as I mentioned, it is easy to be seen, and and we can diagnose it easily by biopsy. The dose of immune sub okay, uh, dose of immune suppression is important in rejection, as I mentioned that one of the important factor, especially in deceased donor, that we give more immune suppression in order to to sacrifice the patient to uh, and to 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 help to initiate a good function graph. That's why some people used to give a very heavy immune suppression and they didn't think about the future of that accumulative now accumulative dose of immune suppression. A high risk of malignancy and, and genital urinary tract concern and the BTLD, especially in rejection episode, anti-rejection syrup. So the kind of rejection syrup is important and how many episodes of rejection the patient's gut is important. Overall immune suppression dose is associated with increased cancer risk it reduces the immunity, reduces the antiviral response by increasing the virus-induced tumor, and there is possibility for direct carcinogenic effect of immunosuppression drug, and especially in cyclosporin and azathioprine. This two drug is very important, uh, causing uh, malignancy. Uh, it contributes uh, the in different kind of immunosuppression agent, uh, and again. We cannot say exactly, but still all of this, some studies which shows to us that kind of immunosuppressions can increase the risk of uh, cancer post-transplantation. Uh, I mentioned this before, but I'll go quickly that kind like a uh, calcium inhibitor, uh, the method of action inhibit interleukin-2 uh, and uh, Again, the, the, the way to, to do it is the inhibition of the immunosuppression. And out of this, it becomes like a carcinogenic because it, it promotes invasive behavior uh, of the cells and reduce the ability to repair the radiation uh, induced DNA damage, enhance apoptic effect of the taxol, as I mentioned before, which again, all of this is the carcinogenic and increase the incidence of the cancer. This is different kind of immune suppression act differently. And at the end result, we can see that the cancer increase in, in uh, such patient. Uh, probably there is variation between one drug to another, but still at the end result, we, can, we have to optimize our immune suppression in a medium dose, which can help us protecting the graft at the same time, not to switch, not to 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 switch it to the rejection or to make him more carcinogenic. Again, one of the induction therapy is interleukin two receptors antagonist. Still, the dose does not appear to be associated with increased cancer. Uh, but uh, almituzumab and uh, again very important drug which seems to be that it increase the risk of the lymphoma and thyroid cancer and it is a good drug everyone now speaking about it but still there is a risk of to develop lymphoma and colorectal lymphoma emuran increase the risk of malignancy for sure calcium inhibitors like cyclosporin tacrolimus increase the risk of malignancy uh, we have uh, uh, studies which show that reducing the dose of tacrolimus through the rough level led to complete disappearance of uh, BTLD. And this is myself, I have few cases like this, which after I reduce the dose, BTLD completely disappeared. MMF, as I mentioned before, uh, risk is there, but it is uncertain. So it is not sure that MMF uh, can produce cancer like others. mTOR inhibitor, uh, there are many case report and real transplant the recipient with caput sarcoma. Uh, and it seems that switching uh, cyclosporin to serolomas result in total resolution of uh, caput sarcoma. Uh, it is very important again to, to, to look here about serolomas. Serolomas probably it is a good drug. Some people at one stage 
they were giving a lot of uh, serolimus decrease calcium inhibitor start serolimus switching from prograph uh, or tacrolimus and cyclosporin to serolimus but they get more rejection they get more heart disease they get more infection that's why uh, it seems to be that using serolimus in a loose dose with calcium inhibitor is acceptable but alone it will have uh, a lot of uh, problem and there is some conflicting data about the use of it. Uh, again, very important again for us and to be transparent with our patients. Uh, if someone uh, coming to us, uh, we should uh, screen them very well. Uh, first from the start, the waiting time to get a kidney. If he had a previous cancer, it's very important. We have to have guidelines for this, how long the patient should wait in order to get again uh, transplantation. Uh, this is important and we have to see, look for the evident, uh, evident drug or evident uh, articles to show to us how long we should wait. No one know exactly how long we should wait. And we cannot predict that the patient will not get again another uh, cancer or recurrence of the disease after transplant. No one can see, but at least the studies shows to us sometimes uh, how long we should wait. Longer waiting list, again, as I mentioned, do not eliminate the risk to have a cancer recurrence, which is, again, very important point. Sometimes we wait for two years, three years, five years sometimes, and then transplant the patient and he can have recurrence. So the optimal cancer screening strategy is very important and it should be defined that how long we should screen and how frequent we should screen our patient from cancer. And the general practice, we have to have guideline as a recommendation in our transplant patients when and how to screen them post kidney transplantation. There are many uh, recommended uh, screening post transplantation in different places in Kidugo, uh, ABPG, AST, everyone uh, mentioned how frequent. And it seems that if you have invasive cancers, you should screen more frequent. If you have less invasive, you can go to the like general populations screening. But uh, it is very important that the patient himself should be aware that he can have cancer post-transplantation, he can have skin cancer, he can have some other cancer post-transplant, and we should explain to them, uh, be the, the patient who get a cancer before transplantation, that the recurrence is there, and they, we should avoid the recurrence as much as we can. So all the recommendations from different, uh, different institutions, as I mentioned, it is different, but at the end, we should screen our patient very well be transparent with our patient about the recurrence of the disease. There are many, uh, many, uh, many cancers which we cannot do with any transplant. There is absolute contraindication to go for transplantation if we have uncontrolled or untreated malignancy. If you have someone who had malignancy, active malignancy, we should not think about transplantation. Multiple myeloma. But I should mention here that with the advance of medicine, we started to have manage, we started to manage multiple myeloma in a good way and the cured way. And I think many people start now to think to transplant those patients with cured multiple myeloma. Advanced breast cancer, stage three and, and four, I think it should be avoided to be transplanted. Colorectal cancer, stage D, should be avoided. And advanced prostate cancer, grade 4 and 5, should be also avoided. So there are some cancers which we should not think about transplantation. The only one which I can take it out is the multiple myeloma from here if it is treated for a long time. And we have to think again the recommended waiting period with time. We have to look for the other experience as well. Uh, different experience about the waiting time, how long we should wait if we develop some kind of cancer treated 
how long we should wait. In, in my practice myself, usually I didn't transplant patient before two years, uh, should be cured, and I should have a referral from the oncologist that the patient is completely cured for two years from the disease, and he can go for tra transplantation if needed. There are some recommendation for the waiting time after cancer. There is no waiting time in superficial bladder cancer, which again, many of uh, our patients could have it. Non-metastatic basal cell carcinoma, prostatic cancer, microscopic focal, microscopic low grade, and incidentally discovered the T1 renal cell carcinoma with no suspicions of a surgical feature, monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Again, some mild cancers localized, we can, we can uh, go ahead with the transplant without waiting time. Two years waiting time, invasive bladder cancer, in situ breast cancer, localized cervical cancer, dox stage A and B1 colorectal cancer, hodgkin lymphoma, non-hodgkin lymphoma, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. This is different a little bit, this lymphoma, which again, it can be cured, especially post-transplantation. And lung cancers, when it is not especially localized one. Five years, stage two breast cancer, extensive cervical uh, cancer and non-in situ cancer of uterus, colorectal cancer stage C, melanoma, large or invasive or symptomatic renal cell carcinoma. What about the treatment? Treatment is, this is again, we are speaking about very important subject. It's a cancer. It could have metastasis. It could have uh, it spread quickly because of the immunosuppression. So what we should do with such patient? The first thing is to reduce the immunosuppression, which is recommended in all cancers. The effect of immunosuppression as a cancer risk is, is known. And uh, if uh, we uh, immunocompromise the patient by ourselves, it, it, it can be worsening his condition. And if we withdraw or at least think about withdrawing or come, come down with the immune separation, it reverses some of the cancer, mainly the infectious related cancer. This doesn't hold true that end stage related cancers. Again, this is about end stage uh, real disease related cancer is still there even the, the you transplant or not, still the patients can develop cancer. Some centers convert patients from non-melanoma skin cancer to mTOR inhibitor therapy. Some think that mTOR inhibitors can help them. But again, mTOR inhibitors can have another side effect, which again, especially in, in, in the heart and the infection. Uh, randomized clinical trials have shown fewer skin cancer in mTOR inhibitor treated patient. Uh, for solid and hematological cancer, mTOR inhibitor have a marginal success. Routine conversion to mTOR inhibitor in all center is not recommended at all because as I mentioned, infections can increase and cardiac can increase and the patients can die from other reasons. Again, as I mentioned, disease uh, donors, uh, cannabis donor is again an important factor to increase lymphoma because of uh, heavy immunosuppression. One year survival is 60% versus five year survival of 40%. BTLD with lymph node involvement have a good prognosis because it can be treated. BTLD with the disseminated disease have a very poor uh, prognosis. Now I will represent one important uh, patient, which I, uh, is my own patient. She is 72 years old. I think she is a textbook of um, medicine and transplantation. And I again, I think that one of the longest survival after BTLD. Her initial diagnosis was in 1982 with nephrotic syndrome secondary to focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, progressing to chronic kidney disease at that time in 1982. She had first kidney transplant in 1985, very successful. 
transplant. Unfortunately, she developed post transplant BTLD in 1995. So after 10 years of getting a kidney, she had BTLD and found it to have EBV positive. Oh, she was negative and uh, negative during transplant. We look for her file in 1985, and the donor was positive and she was negative, which again one of the factors which can cause BTLD. How we manage this patient at that time? Uh, very interesting. Professor Starzer and John Fang and myself was involved in treating this patient. And we have a different, you know, uh, multiple meeting and the decision was completely broadly from not come to anyone of our mind. The decision is to sacrifice the kidney and to stop all the immunosuppression therapy because of the BTLD. And this is what we did. We stopped the medication, immunosuppression medication, because of the lymphoma, BTLD. And we kept the patient on dialysis. So the patient rejected, went to dialysis, and she cured completely from BTLD. Then we re-transplant the patient again. And during transplantation, we were thinking that the best way of this patient is to have a low dose immune suppression. And what we did at that time, we have the trends to have bone marrow from the, from the donor to be given to the recipient in order to make what's known as whatever tolerance in the future and to give less immunosuppression. And this was our aim to give a very low dose immunosuppression. And we did uh, bone marrow uh, transplant uh, infusions uh, during uh, the surgery. And the patients had a very well function graft after that. In 2009, she had so after, again, another 10 years, she had recurrent post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease with lymph node, intra-abdominal, pelvic, everywhere, big lymph node. We took biopsy, and we screened the patient at that time with all kind of lymphomas, and we found that she had, again, recurrence of the BTLD and uh, we start with her rituximab therapy. Amazing that after rituximab therapy, all the lymph node disappeared and the patients become asymptomatic and her kidney function was good. She developed later on in 2011, maybe something which is maybe related or not, Kailas pleural effusion and the peritoneal effusion. And as you know that Kailas by itself, it is immune, if we, one of the treatment before, long time, maybe our uh, elderly colleague remember that we were taking the Kailas uh, in order to immunocompromise the patient and to get a transplant. So she developed Kyla's pro effusion and pro uh, and peritoneal effusion uh, treated symptomatically by drainage and uh, by medications and and not cured because we found that even the the lymph lymphatic system become sclerosed and she was the chylus was go, coming around, and so we cannot do anything except by dehydration. Dehydrate the patient, give her more uh, diuretic, and uh, uh, and uh, she had the chylus till she died. 
in 2011. She developed resistance diastolic heart failure, circulatory failure leading to dismiss here. The cause of this was cardiac related, not the kidney. So the kidney was, till the last moment was working. BTLD was having recurrence uh, treated by rituximab. And the lesson which I took from this that immunosuppression therapy uh, continue post transplant, but in a very low dose in order not to have it. Rituximab was at that time very early phase of rituximab. It was very effective in treatment, recurrent BTLD, uh, and symptomatic treatment for the chylus infusion and the heart failure, which she had. This was one of my patients, which had BTLD post transplant, and she had EBV was negative during transplantation. Mr. Chairman, I will conclude here that I'm sure I'm probably I take more than my time. Malignancy is one of the most common cause of death in kidney transplant recipient. Cancer incidence in solid organ transplant is increased two to three fold compared to the general population. Cancer related mortality rate are also higher in solid organ transplant recipient compared with general population. Immunosuppression is the most important risk factor for both transplant cancer. The kidney transplant recipient Cancer incidence and mortality are high during period with the function graft and remained higher in the general population even after graft loss. Reduction of immunosuppression to control of oncogenic viral infections and immunosurveillance immunosuppression agent influence not equals to anti-cancer pathway. Intor inhibitors seem to have a favorable profile but it's not sure about this. However, the increased mortality associated with their use, recent meta-analysis argue against their universal use in renal allograft recipient or switching to mTOR inhibitors in all patients with both transplant malignancy. Thank you very much, and I was happy to, uh, to be a guest of this night, and I'm, I'm sorry that if I take more than uh, of your time. Thank you, Ayman. Thank you, Yasser. Thank you, Professor Thank you Faisal. Thank you very much, Dr. Faisal. Hmm. Professor Ayman, please. Thank you, Professor Faisal. This actually was a very uh, excellent overview about uh, this in Boston topics, both transplant malignancy, uh, and you covered everything, the risk factors, the uh, mechanism, the uh, treatment strategies. Um, I just have uh, some uh, comments I, we should emphasize in uh, this regard. I think uh, uh, prevention is very important because once uh, we diagnose post-transplant malignancy, uh, we have to reduce immune suppression with the uh, risk of the graft loss. So, uh, but uh, I think unfortunately most of our transplant practice and transplant programs lacks the proper and regular screening, as you mentioned. Uh, many centers don't ha apply this uh, important screening, uh, cervical uh, smear, mammography, uh, etc. Uh, even the very simple ultrasound of the native kidney, uh, this is very uh, important uh, because a lot of cases was discovered, especially the renal malignant cysts in the native kidney. And this is uh, curative. We, we can take the kidneys out. Uh, number two, the skin malignancy, which, uh, as you emphasized, that is the most important or most common malignancy after transplantation, especially Kabushi sarcoma. I think we should have careful skin examination during our uh, follow-up examination of the patient. And we should educate our patient to uh, for any strange or any skin lesions they should uh, i have many patients that uh, notice some uh, bluish discoloration of the skin and they thought that this is uh, something like ecchymosis but actually this was kabusi sarcoma so, so at least we should educate uh, our patient about examination of their skin uh, 
Another point, I think uh, we have to tailor our immune suppression. Um, for low-risk patients, for example, or patients with uh, previous cancer who's liable to recurrence, I, I should, we, we should apply uh, minimization protocols for such patients. Uh, and also to avoid unnecessary induction therapy for low-risk patients, especially the uh, depleting agents, as you mentioned, and their close relation with the development of the post-transplant uh, lymphoproliferative uh, diseases. Another point you emphasize that other cyberin is more dangerous than MMF, as uh, many uh, could expect that MMF is a powerful immune suppression, and uh, malignancy uh, will be common. No, azathioprine is, is, is a very uh, incriminated in uh, development of both transplant uh, malignancy. Uh, and this is the very uh, the, the, the first drug to be stopped after uh, diagnosis of uh, malignancy. Um, in your practice, uh, Dr. Faisal, when you uh, have a post-transplant malignancy on patient with triple immune suppression, for example, uh, steroid, tacrolimus, and MMF, what is the order of reduction or cessation of your uh, of the immune suppressive agents? What drug you start with to stop or reduce? And the second question: Do you switch to mTOR inhibitor in non skin malignancy in solid organ uh, malignancy, I mean. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, Ivan, I, uh, you know, I, this question is important because I probably I, I miss one slide uh, about the reduction of the immunosuppression uh, post uh, discovery of malignancy. And the first thing is uh, how much you are going to reduce and what percentage and which drug this is a very important question. Usually, uh, or as a common, 50% uh, of uh, tacrolimus should cut down, 60% of MMF should be cut down, 40 to 60%. And uh, Imuran, if it's there is Imuran, we should stop it completely. And uh, steroid, probably you can keep it or even sometime increase it in order to hold, not to have rejection. But at least, you can cut down the first step to go ahead is to cut down the tacrolimus. Cyclosporin, you should stop, by the way. Cyclosporin is out, tacrolimus 60%, and uh, uh, MMF in between 40 to 60%. Steroid, you can continue. This is uh, the first question, which is the important one because we have to choose. Then, this is the first step, and then you taper it down after that. The second about Omtor, uh, yes, I, I use it, by the way. Uh, if you come, if you remove the calcium and you can move it to probably uh, uh, Everolomas or uh, uh, low dose still. But the outcome is not, is not that significant. The patient is going to by reduction of the his calcium inhibitor, he will have for sure reduction in his also or decrease in his malignancy, but not to the level where he will be cured, except if you have BTLD, if you have Kabut sarcoma, this for sure, if you reduct your immunosuppression, this will disappear. Uh, but to, to, to change it to mTOR inhibitors, as I mentioned to you, Still, mTOR also have a, a complication, some other complication, which can affect the graft as well, or the life of the patient. So you cannot completely shift it because you will have either rejection or you will have some cardiac disease or some infectious disease, which again, dangerous for the patient. So if we shift it, we shift it in a low dose as well. We give it, take it a low dose and low dose of immunosuppression. This balance is important. These two important questions. Shukran, Ayman. Thank you very much, Professor Faisal. Thank you, uh, Professor Faisal. Uh, another I have a question. Uh, another point, uh, please, uh, this is the last point, uh, Professor. 
about uh, some centers uh, brats what is called annual review clinic uh, every year at the date of transplantation they did a comprehensive screening for patients annually and uh, with the brats of this the annual review clinic they got a lot of uh, uh, things to uh, to treat uh, not only malignancy, but cardiovascular uh, bone. I think the, the, we, this is very easy, and we uh, if we apply this clinic, uh, it will uh, have a lot of benefits, at least uh, also for, for research. Uh, what do you think about this uh, idea? I think it is an excellent idea if it is implemented, uh, but this is maybe for the academic people, they like it more for more research. But for the practical, you will, because now you are facing the insurance company and unnecessary investigation, they will think that it's unnecessary, mm -hmm. but you think it is necessary. They will reject it because they said, why? Why you should screen uh, dermatology, oncology, doing some uh, uh, colonoscopy, endoscopy, post-transplant, which is important. Uh, in, in, in the clinic, which you mentioned, it is, it is very essential, and probably we have, as a nephrologist, requested this to be in our institutions and to be part of our war, part of the our duty against our, our patients. Uh, I agree. Uh, the patient does not know what's going on in his skin, something happened in his skin. It is a kabusi, probably. It is cancer, but he doesn't know. It is a very small, and it is just neglected. Uh, you should see it. We should see the patient uh, pick up these things. Uh, someone who had uh, anemia post transplantation probably had cancer colon, and uh, we cannot we didn't request uh, uh, colonoscopy. Or someone who had uh, gastric problems, we, we don't screen them. Uh, but this is probably uh, it's important, and uh, uh, we have our young colleague here. Uh, they should request that for the for the sake of the patient and uh, the outcome of the transplantation. Thank you, Dr. Faisal. Dr. Yasser, would you like to introduce the, the we have uh, uh, Dr. Yad Sa'il and Professor David Bilal, I think uh, they uh, they have some comments. Please, uh, Professor Yad. Professor Dawlat. Professor Dawlat, unmute yourself, please. Professor Dawlat? Is it okay? Okay, yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the informative lecture, uh, uh, Professor Faisal. Uh, I just, maybe I have a comment, not a question. When I worked in Saudi Arabia for some time, I have noticed that the Kapusi sarcoma presentation is different from the Kapusi sarcoma presentation in Egypt. In Saudi Arabia, I always notice that it's, it comes as a non-resolving hematoma in the skin. Um, when you have a highest index of suspicion you, you, in a transplant patient, <clears throat> you, can, you can guess that this is Kaposi sarcoma. And also uh, the staging of Kaposi sarcoma in Saudi Arabia, it was most of the time skin. Uh, I didn't see any distal uh, uh, spread of the sarcoma. While in Egypt, uh, <clears throat> I remember one case post transplant when she had the Kaposi sarcoma in the kidney, in the transplanted kidney itself. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> the treatment uh, which uh, was uh, made all the time was not only a reduction in the immunosuppression, but uh, also they started some chemo uh, therapy for this sarcoma. And I remember Vin Christine. Uh, was uh, was uh, actually used for many times, and of course the the resolution rate was very high when it is uh, restricted to the skin. Uh, that's all. Mm. Thank you, Thank Professor Dawlat. Hey, this is uh, you know, Kabus sarcoma is being uh, published by our late colleague uh, Abdullah Al Khidr Al Sayari. He, he did a lot of work in, in Kabul sarcoma in, in Saudi Arabia and in military hospital, where probably mm -hmm. you get your result. But uh, 
in other parts of Saudi Arabia, uh, we get kaboos sarcoma in different places, uh, not only even in genital <coughs> yeah, and some uh, uh, rectal and different places. Uh, yes. uh, probably the behavior is different, which can be. Again, and uh, again, we, we, we are a sunny area, exposure to sun, probably this, again, another precipitating factor which uh, increase in kabosi with immunosuppression drug. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it is different, but it was uh, a disease which uh, alarming all the nephrologists and in one stage because of high dose of immunosuppression and the start, the level was, uh, the trough level was, uh, was, we were looking a little bit higher and that's why the incidence was high as well. One study which is very, very interesting by uh, Dr. Suleiman, also a military hostel, he were giving cyclosporin uh, uh, and see the, the he holds the cyclosporin and then start prograph after that and he showed that there is a recurrence of BTLD even after starting another immunosuppression. This one study probably he published it at that time but I'm aware of that uh, work. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Daulat, Professor Riyad Said, please. Uh, شكرا يا فيصل على محاضرة الله يخليك مساء الخير أيمن مساء الخير ياسر فيصل it was really nice talk I have really again same comment about Kapusi sarcoma I think in the last 15 years or so the number and incidence at least that what I saw is quite quite low and I don't know if this is really because we are switching immune suppressive agent we are abandoning immuran as a tapping and we are switching from cyclosporin to tacrolimus uh, that's really, I noticed this, I cannot recall, I saw a case of Kapusi in the last 15 years of my practice in Jordan. While, while in Saudi Arabia, again, we used to see a good number of patients, especially coming patients who are coming from the southern part of Saudi Arabia. What's your comment, Faisal? Yes, uh, Prof. Riyad, uh, you know that when we start uh, cyclosporin, our trough level was a little bit high. Uh, we were looking for a, a high, uh, you know, level of the of the drug, and that's why the patient were taking up to ten to fifteen milligram per kg, and that's why maybe this is the main reason because after reduction of immunosuppression, kabusi uh, disappear. We don't. It is very rare now to have any kabusi in, in Saudi Arabia because the trap level is low, uh, either from uh, brograph or from uh, cyclosporin. And we usually don't use any more, uh, very rare to use cyclosporin, except if we have HUS for some patient with, uh, with tacrolimus, we shift him to cyclo. But uh, otherwise, we, we, our patients all in triple therapy and uh, TAG, uh, MMF, and prednisolone, and rarely now have any kaboot sarcoma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Riyad. Uh, we have some questions. Yes, sir, let me comment, please, on this uh, very important point that raised by Professor Wright Said. Totally agree that in the uh, last uh, decade, uh, I will tell you about our experience in Mansoura that we published this phenomena uh, in Journal of Oncology uh, two years ago. We noticed that there is no uh, reported cases in our series since 2010 uh, of kabus of a single kabusic sarcoma. So this was uh, worth to be reported. Uh, we didn't see kabusi over the uh, last 15 years, and in this articles we explained this by three main reasons. Number one. Uh, when we start to apply minimization protocol in the steroid Freud, uh, free regimen, this in was uh, 2006. This was one of the contributing uh, reasons. The other is the at that time we started also to introduce mTOR inhibitor in our um, immunosuppression uh, armamentarium and protocols. The third reason that we start the uh, routine prophylaxis for CMV. Uh, as you know, that CMV is one of the uh, herpes viruses, and it's covered also the herpes virus 8, which is 
uh, accused or incriminated in the development of Kabusi. So this was the our explanation that over the last decade, we didn't see a single case of uh, Kabusi among our seers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ayman. Some questions uh, question in the chat from Dr. Uh, Mustafa Al Al oh. Baba about uh, uh, any recommendation for to remove the cystic, uh, the native kidney if it's uh, acquired cystic disease, not the adult polycystic, acquiring cases of acquired cystic disease, any recommendation to remove pre-transplantation? Regarding, of course, uh, this issue of malignancy. Uh, most of I think your question is valid, but uh, it's expensive to put a patient in a very major surgery uh, without evidence that you have cancer. Uh, so uh, I know that any cystic change can be at any stage change to be malignant, but uh, you are not sure either it will become or not. Uh, so I, I think such recommendations, you cannot give it uh, blindly like this uh, because it is again it cost and it is the uh, major surgery to have uh, bilateral nephrectomy uh, for all the ckd patients who start to have a cyst and any patients who stayed in a dialysis for five to ten years he will have some sort of cystic change in the kidney it's not necessary to be malignant but it can be turned to be malignant in the future few of them not all of them yeah, thank you, Professor. Uh, I, I think I'm... also we have the uh, the MR uh, and the staging, the Bosniak staging. I mean, if it is suspicious by the MR and the Bosniak 2 or more, I think uh, uh, we should rely on the imaging in this situation, not uh, not any uh, cyst to be uh, uh, the... worth to remove the kidney. I think, I think the radiology is very important. Any complicated cyst, or the Bosniak stage, the advanced Bosniak stage should be uh, nephrectomized. I yeah. think that is, Professor Ayman is for uh, uh, prophylaxis, not in uh, complicated cyst or uh, proved to have some complication of uh, native kidney, acquired cystic disease uh, regarding transplantation. Any recommendation for this? Is this... Well, I... Uh... As I mentioned, it is, uh, all the patients will have some sort of acquired cystic disease. I am, I am I'm doing myself yes. a sound for all my patients and all the patients who stayed more than five years, they will start to have some cystic change in their native kidney, dialysis patient. So it, probably it's not necessary to go further. And as Prof. Ayman said, radiology can help us in this without going for to nephrectomize such patients. Okay, so no, no nephrectomy except uh, if there is radiological changes. This is our recommendations. Okay, Professor Rasham Sai, please. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Faisal. Uh, it was very interesting and informative, illuminating. You covered a lot, and uh, let, let me start by the end, if you allowed me that. We just uh, approval for a case of uh, caput sarcoma this year. Interestingly. It was uh, within a year of transplantation on immunosuppression. Uh, my second comment is uh, just we received a very informative plenary session in the last era, a few days ago. And interestingly, it described, subhanAllah, يعني, the effect of intermittent fasting. They are not Muslims. The effect of intermittent fasting on chromosomal and phenotype changes in mouse and post-surgical uh, healing with lower diet, uh, caloric diet reduction, 30%. And it showed that the mouse uh, for phenotype chromosomal changes return back to normal physiological when they do uh, periodic fasting. And I think this animal model in our culture may, may be one of the uh, tools that we can start with uh, post-transplant period to encourage intermittent fasting like etnino uh, khamis or something like that if immunosuppression uh, uh, duration in between drugs are required or no contraindication of fasting for antihypertension and so it it could be one of the prospective studies uh if you allow me just to have a uh, two question you perfectly mentioned that uh, immature effect on vascular endothelial growth factor. 
We know that it's uh, essential for any tumor growth to increase its vasculature. But I didn't recognize the effect of other on vascular and cellular growth factor, and if it's inhibitory as well. What do you think about the tumor spread or growth? We understand the prevalence or incidence of malignancy in post-transplant, but the size, limitation, and uh, uh, extension spreading of the this malignancy. Uh, any data on that? This is my first question. My second question, in patient with myeloma, which are huge population on dialysis, uh, do you think that uh, bone marrow transplantation will be essential prior to renal transplantation or not? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think, Prof. Uh, Hisham, uh, about MTOR, actually, it is, uh, there are many studies, not only one, uh, BRU and against, And mostly the recommendation is, uh, is probably equals and not uh, it will not help too much the uh, and uh, the outcome will probably it's, it, it's equal it's been used with some center but uh, still uh, there is no fixed outcome to to show that the, the, they are very effective uh, regarding myeloma as i mentioned that the only only disease which we can think about to transplant him again, re-transplant him is, uh, uh, is myeloma after treatment, after management. And uh, uh, the bone marrow uh, infusion or transplant uh, for after uh, for myeloma, it will help probably either to decrease the immunosuppression which have been taken, but I don't know either you mean by transfusion? Recurrence. From, Recurrence from, of myeloma and... Uh, uh, okay. It is from the donor, or you mean it is as a whole, as... Uh, as if, a, the uh, if the recipient has multiple myeloma treated or controlled, yes. you think that bone marrow ablations and the bone marrow transplantation this is, for uh, the prevalence uh, yeah, and uh, recurrence of myeloma? Yes, this is what we did in our case that uh, it is not myeloma, but it was uh, BTLD, and we have bone marrow, and this actually helped us to reduce the medication post-transplant in order to give her. This, um, my, the case which I represent, it may be, as far as I know, that no one with uh, lymphoma can stay for 25 years. She stayed for sure, 20 years. Sure, sure. Thank uh, you very much. One of the longest. So probably, bone marrow helped us actually to reduce the medication and to keep her uh, alive for a uh, for long time. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Ayman, please. Professor Ayman? Yes, Professor, yes. Yes, uh, the, uh, the question, the, uh, the other question, the second question in the chat, I think it's about... Uh, Professor Dawla Pilal wants to add a comment. Okay. Please unmute yourself. I have, I, I have a question. Suppose we are good enough and uh, careful enough and we are screening virology for a recipient before he re uh, receives his graft. And I discovered that he's Epstein Barr virus positive with a good PCR. What is going to be my policy to take uh, to transplant this patient? especially and to make it more difficult if he doesn't get a very good match, say uh, uh, a one uh, zero two mismatch, what would we do? Shall we transplant him or treat him first for the Epstein Barr virus and, and then uh, transplant? Is IgM or IgD positive, ABB? Uh, shall I repeat the question? No, no, he is I, IgM or IgB? Uh, 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 IgG. No. Ah, okay, I think, well, I can, this is uh, risky a little bit, uh, patient, so we, we, we should probably wait till he had antibodies. Otherwise, we put him in risk because reactivation itself, it can cause BTLD. So either it's coming exactly. from him or coming from the donor. So uh, we we have to be a little bit cautious with with such patient with ABV positive. And if you decide to induce him, 
What are you going to choose for induction? Induction therapy. Uh, well, I, I I think I will I will treat him like anyone, not uh, not a risk here. Uh, I, I I will choose the lowest immunosuppression I can, uh, like what I have. Yeah, bone marrow probably transfusion and take a low immunosuppression tag MMF, uh, prednisolone in a lowest dose, in order to keep the graft function without over immunosuppression. Mm. I think we should avoid the uh, lymphocyte depleting agents, uh, mm. and to have if we need. Uh, interleukin 2 receptor antagonist, basiliximab, uh, rather than having any weak agent, uh, yes, the uh, alemtuzumab or the ATG. Mm. Because we always discover it post transplant, <laughs> but uh, yes. if you go beforehand, uh, I think we should uh, treat him differently. So he needs screening more, Dr. Adawlat, after that. Yes, yes. 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 But we don't really screen for Epstein viral virus. We just go ahead. No, and then I, later. The recommendation is to screen him again every three months. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. for maybe you do a PCR or whatever every three months for one yeah, year. Dialysis patients on yeah. a, on a waiting list. A patient yeah. on a waiting list. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Daulat. Uh, in the chat, we have really. Uh, two uh, important comments or suggestions from uh, Dr. Muhammad Abdelbari to have uh, one from Dr. Muhammad Abdelbari to have a screening program uh, or such a consensus about screening program for uh, even GN patients taking immunosuppressive patient, uh, immunosuppressive drugs uh, about for these malignancies how uh, every how much to be screened every how, how many period, how many months or how many years, and what is the type of screen, even starting not for transplantation, even starting on patients on immunosuppressives, uh, GN patients. And the second, of course, we discussed it a lot from Dr. Masoud Khairi about uh, oncology, kidney oncology clinics, and uh, multidisciplinary action with oncologists and nephrologists. Uh, Professor Saeed Khamis, please. Unmute yourself. Thank you, Professor Yasser. Thank you, Professor Faisal, for this elegant presentation as usual. Uh, just I have uh, one question regarding the case you uh, you, you told uh, about the, this uh, my uh, sorry lymphoma case. My, uh, this case, actually, if you face uh, a CMS lymphoma uh, and you cannot give rituximab in such a case because rituximab, as you know, it, it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. What is the alternative to treat such a patient? And thank you so much. Thank you. Actually, for this patient, we were checking CD20, CD19, and uh, follow up this one. And it was uh, CD20 was very high, and that's why probably she responded very well to uh, rituximab. If uh, uh, if I don't have a rituximab or it is contraindicated in some way or another and the patients had lymphoma, probably the oncology people will help us in this. Uh, I cannot uh, judge. I cannot uh, say what I should do. I will stuck. But rituximab is available, and it is a good drug, actually. Yeah, I mean, but I don't mean the availability. I mean it, it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So in serious uh -huh. lymphoma, it will not be effective. Yes. That's, that's my concern. I, I will ask the oncologist to help me in this. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Ayman, there is a, a, a comment from... Uh, a question, I think, uh, from Dr. Masoud Khairi about uh, to what extent should we explain to our patient the risk of malignancies and pre-transplantation counseling? Should we discuss them? And he's stressed about the benefit of this uh, medical legally uh, to discuss with them and ex uh, explain the risk of these malignancies and which type. Do you, are these any recommendations regarding this? I think this is not uh, a common practice to to give the patient the whole uh, 
possible complications, the infections, opportunistic, opportunistic infections, the malignancy. Uh, I don't think that anyone practices this to give uh, uh, all these nightmares to the patient who's going to be transplanted. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't know any program that emphasize on all these complications uh, prior to transplantation. Do you do you practice this, uh, Professor Faisal? You yeah. inform the patients. I, I, yeah, I mean, I yes, I uh, we didn't inform, we inform the patient who had cancer that he may have recurrence of this. Yes, yes, I totally cancer. agree. I mean, the the naive patient without uh, pre transplant no. cancer. Actually, no, they will not. They will not go for transplant. Uh, and if you want to have a, a good program, just uh, yes. Ignore all of this, but if he had something which have like, like uh, glomerulonephritis, if if someone had FSGS, you can tell him that you will have a high incidence of recurrence of, of the glomerulonephritis totally yes. kidney. Yes, maybe the outcome is this. We you ha we have to tell him them, but uh, as uh, overall we can tell about this cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, lip cancer, skin cancer, they will not transplant. They will not go for transplant. Yes, of course. Uh, I, I have I have two questions, Professor Faisal, please. Uh, uh, the first is uh, you said that you, uh, in case of cyclosporin, you uh, stop cyclosporin completely, and you do not use uh, mTOR serolimus or something like this, uh, and you do uh, you in uh, usual practice in cancer. So, uh, what's your practice in the patient uh, taking? Uh, Cyclosporin, which are are common, is still common. Uh, do you shift to tacrolimus with fifty percent reduction of the dose immediately, and uh, does this uh, carry a risk of for a graft uh, rejection, immediate graft rejection? This rapid shift or a lower dose? No, I think uh, it it will not because this is both of them are calcium inhibitor. One of them is potent, which is tacrolimus. Mm. Uh, second one is cyclo. I am moving completely. percent. Yeah, shift to the reduced dose as you recommended, 50% of that dose? 50% I recommend uh, mm. as a general practice, 50% of the chromos to cut down and mm. to uh, to continue probably with MMF and the brednisolone. MMF also cutting down and remove cyclosporin. Okay. Uh, my second question is that about the case. Uh, to reiterate, said, uh, uh, just comment on your question. Uh, don't forget that uh, the patient developed post transplant malignancy as he was over immune suppressed. As mm. Professor Faisal said, this is the net mm -hmm. over uh, immune suppression. So don't be afraid that you cut uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dose to 50%. This patient is already over immune suppressed. That's why he developed a malignancy. Yes. So I think, uh, yeah. It's safe for just uh, a rapid shift. With uh, the decreasing the dose, uh, you you feel both uh, that it is safe to make some change like this. I I, I know that it is not that the issue of the graft uh, of priority, but uh, for me I I imagine that it is a very rapid shift, declining from one drug to another immediately on fifty percent of the dose. But I think you feel that it is that safe to do in the view of this malignancy. Yes. Okay, thank you. My second question regarding the case, Professor Faisal, you said that chylus uh, effusions and uh, peritoneal and pleural effusion is not explained. What about recurrence of uh, lymphadenopathies or lymphatic uh, disease? Mm -hmm. said that no, no recurrence at that at that time. I think it can be explained the chylus effusion. Well, I I think we we investigated this very well and we didn't found the cause. We found. What we can find is the lymphatic sclerosed vessels. Mm. That's it. This is like cracks. It was cracking, and and uh, it's, it is not. Uh, we we thought it is lymphoma, but it was not. Mm. Uh, there is no other things which you can. Oh. Well, can was excluded thoroughly excluded. No, it it been excluded actually. Mm. It okay. was the callus itself. It was. You know, it, it was a milky things coming out from the abdomen, from the chest, from, and uh, I reduce further the immune suppression even when I saw the chylus because it's uh, anyone with chylus mean that you really immunocompromised. This all the immunity is coming out, uh, uh, so all his triggers is out. 
uh, but uh, it goes with uh, with the over the uresis of the patients and it, it come down and calm down in one stage, but uh, doesn't last for long because the patient have cardiac issue. Of course, it was, it was a challenge. Hmm. Thank you so much. The last, the last comment, Professor Ayman from Dr. Professor Ahmad Yassin, the idea and, of... Uh, do, and Dr. Uh, Professor Sahir Al-Khashab, I think, uh, have also comment. She, she raised her hand. Okay. Sahir, please. Unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faisal, for this uh, very nice lecture, and thank you, Dr. Riazer, for choosing this very interesting topic. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, the dosage, uh, uh, as uh, I was very happy to hear uh, as my experience also that uh, we didn't uh, I, or we don't see lots of uh, post-transplant malignancies uh, in Egypt over the last 20 years. Uh, but uh, when we do, we do decrease the, the immunosuppression or we shift to another uh, immunosuppressor. From your experience, Dr. Faisal, uh, would you ever uh, consider returning to uh, the usual dose? And if so, after how how many uh, months or so? Because uh, commenting also on Dr. Ayman's uh, comment that uh, the patient uh, who develops uh, Kaposi sarcoma or any type of malignancy is over immunosuppressed, but sometimes he's over immunosuppressed in this period of his life. For example, patients who develop Kaposi sarcoma and are on a very low dose when you decrease from 50-50 cyclosporin to 25-25, I think all of us would agree that this uh, will cause uh, more uh, liability to rejection. So my question is, would you ever consider returning to the usual uh, dosages? And if so, after how much time? Thank you, Dr. Suhair, for this uh, question. I think our aim is... Uh, uh, to shift the patient from highly immunocompromised to a patient which is uh, normal, at least immunity a little bit, uh, to help him to, to, to live safely. And uh, one of the things which, again, against us as a nephrologist is that we don't uh, follow up carefully the immunosuppression drug post-transplant. So over time, the patient probably was taking a very high immunosuppression drug and we don't take care of this. We don't reduce the dose. And maybe when he got a, a cancer or something, we start to think about reducing the dose. And probably I will not come again, uh, except if I have a very low level of tacrolimus or cyclo or something. At that time, I have to think about rejection. But otherwise, I will not shift him back to his high dose, which he had it, uh, before. Uh, by the way, I mean, our patient after a long time, they are taking a very low dose, like uh, Brograph, they are taking one milligram, uh, sometimes BD only, uh, and uh, Cyclo, sometimes 25 milligram only uh, for a long time, and they live long without any complication, without any rejection. So I will not shift him again to higher dose. Uh, I try to avoid it as much as I can. Okay, thank you. Professor Faisal, before I, uh, uh, the last uh, comment from Professor Ahmad Yassin, I excuse me all to thank uh, our coordinator today, the big star, big nephrologist star, uh, Dr. Karim Salem, for uh, all of his work and all of his activities regarding in, uh, nephrology, uh, immunity in Egypt. Thank you, and the Egyptian Society of Nephrology, especially. Thank you, Karim. And comment from uh, uh, Dr. Ahmad. Ahmad Yassin, he said that the idea of a link, with, uh, he is speaking about that, uh, decreasing the dose of MMF, and with further decrease of immunosuppression, can this, this by this way, uh, by this time, by decreasing MMF and other doses of immunosuppression, can this make a space more for MMF? He is interested with uh, depending on MMF in such a way and decreasing other uh, immunosuppressants. Do you recommend something like this? MMF alone uh, will not uh, hold uh, the graft. MMF, uh, you should have some calcium inhibitors uh, with it. Uh, but if you, there are many studies try to use uh, microphenolate uh, alone with the steroid and it doesn't work. Probably, I mean, also, there is something in Mansoura also about uh, using MMF uh, with uh, with as far as I know, I don't, I'm not sure. Maybe I can correct me. Uh, there is some study about this. But usually we need 
calcium inhibitor even in a low, very lowish dose, dose. To, to be dose. given because the mechanism of rejection, if you look, you will find that MMF will not cover everything. I mean, I, I need your comment to possible. You, you did some study about this, isn't it? Yes, uh, totally agree that uh, a small uh, amount of CNI with the low window counts. We need it in a, in a small dose. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we cannot rely after a long period of transplantation on antiproliferative uh, and uh, steroids alone. Uh, still, some dose or some uh, low uh, window of CNI uh, is important. Uh, even if we uh, we can rely on the CNI and the steroid without the antiproliferative, it's better than uh, eliminating the CNI from the protocol. We can have dual therapy with the CNI and steroids. Okay. Thank you. Last uh, comment, uh, the, Sahir Al Khashab, please, Professor Sahir. Um, uh, if we dream uh, big and do a multi synthetic study uh, in all Arab countries uh, and uh, unify a questionnaire form or uh, 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 any form of questionnaire that is uh, unified to all uh, post transplant malignancies, uh, I would add, for example, uh, fasting. Maybe fasting, uh, as we all fast, decreases the incidence of malignancy. Uh, in comparison to the Western uh, countries in which the uh, malignancies are increasing, maybe fasting, for, for example. Uh, from your experience, Dr. Faisal, what, uh, what item would you add uh, to Saudi Arabia? I would add, for example, in Egypt, uh, sadly, that uh, patients sometimes decrease their immunosuppression uh, voluntarily due to financial issues, for, exam for example. But... Uh, to formulate it better, uh, we need to think about it. What item would you add to Saudi Arabia as a factor that decreases the post-transplant malignancies in comparison to the Western countries? I think, uh, you know, sun is important in Saudi Arabia. We have uh, a very, uh, very hot weather here, and we can compare the exposures to sun uh, to skin malignancy especially. In, in Saudi Arabia, which is again uh, very very important, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, lower, lowering the drug, we have uh, around thirty percent of our population they are non-Saudi, so it's not easy for them to to uh, sometimes to have this such expensive medication, and it is except if they support it. So we are we are the same in the same boat. Uh, the people are looking to decrease uh, immunosuppression medications as much as they can, either by drugs or by neglecting taking some medication. This is a challenge point also, which we should look uh, for in, in, in Saudi Arabia. 30% is not easy uh, as the population are non-Saudi and they are transplanted. Thank, Thank you. you Professor. Professor Ayman, we reach at the end of uh, this uh, very interesting and fruitful session. Can you close, please? Well, this is a, was a very uh, rich and uh, informative uh, lecture, Professor Faisal, and a very fruitful discussion. And I think in the end that we, we, we need an intense collaboration between the uh, nephrologists and oncologists uh, in order to design a safer immune suppressive regimen and define uh, an optimal screening and treatment strategies in our transplant. We, we need to have a, a protocol for screening. So uh, I think in, 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 the, um, in the future, in the near future, we will call for a, a screening protocol uh, guidelines to be uh, applied. I think uh, it's very simple, uh, especially the non-invasive procedures it's very important to have scans, to have mammography. Uh, all these uh, are very simple and uh, important. So we need a call for uh, the uh, establishment of uh, proper post-transplant screening with the help of our uh, colleagues in the oncology. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Professor Faisal. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yasser, for choosing this timely important uh, issue in our clinical practice it's very practical very applied and uh, very important as well thank you very much thank you
thank you professor thank you professor faisal for this very interesting session and for your uh, highly varied experience that uh, really you know, made a very huge difference and great benefits for all of us uh, and uh, thank you for all professors who attended the session for this very fruitful discussions and work comments experiences thank you for all uh, attendees and for their active share and for the questions interactions and excuse me to close this very interesting and long session we approach we i think we approach it two hours which is one of the longest uh, thank you and thank uh, you. meet you uh, next wednesday inshallah professor said khamis will speak about his uh, favorable topic about uh, green dialysis. Thank you very much. Meet you next Wednesday, 9.30 p.m. Uh, Cairo time. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Professor Faisal. Shukran gazilan. Bye-bye.